sight. I will go where you shine, break the dawn, crack the sky, make the way bright before me in your light. I will find all I need, all I need is you. Hey, my glorious light, I will go where you shine, break the dawn, crack the sky, make the way bright before me. Hey man, stopping out was great, but uh, this is taking me longer and longer to recover. Because you're old. Oh. Hey, for first news, I'm Chris. And I'm Micah. Chris, I gotta tell you something. Okay. There's two nights I'm very excited about. Okay. One is a Nerf night with the teenagers. Okay. It's gonna be a Nerf night, it's for youth only. Okay. We're so excited. Okay. But Ginger, the children's ministry, yes. they have something coming up. Okay. They have Nerf and nachos. Wait, those are two things that I like. Right? Yes. Those are two of the greatest things ever. Nerf okay. and nachos okay. coming up just for the children's ministry. Okay. It's, it's going to be great. She's going to have so much fun. Okay. And here's the great part. If uh, you are you have a kid and they're like, I really want to go to that. But Ooh. yeah. But you don't have a Nerf weapon? Take your thought a bunch of Nerf Ooh. weapons for those who don't have their own. That explains her office. Right? I thought that was your office. No, I, I did too. I've walked into it so Okay, times. so when is it? So they're they're going to have nachos, so uh -huh. it's dinner's covered. Right. You know, it's it's going to be good. Okay, and it is? They got the Nerf blasters. Bring your own okay. or use some of Ginger's. Okay, so when is it? Yeah, queso. Like queso, like queso cheese, like cheese what, on the nachos. How do I know when to come? What? Like, how do I find out about it? I just told you. No, you find out about it by coming to uh, to, to Bible study oh. or to Wednesday nights. Oh. Ginger okay. is going to talk about it then, but she's only given out the day and the time during Bible study and on Wednesday nights. So be here Sundays and Wednesdays. Be here Sundays and Wednesdays. And you'll find out about Nerf and Nachos. Nerf and Nachos. Okay, so let me ask a question. Yes. If I have my own Nerf gun mm -hmm. and I like nachos, I am the family pastor, can I come? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. Now, I'm the youth pastor. Oh, and these are probably future youth. These are future youth. Okay. So, I also like Nerf and Nachos. So, we will see you there for Nerf and Nachos. That's right. So, for First News, I'm Chris. And I'm Micah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Every day. Every day. Somebody just leaned up and said, you work with those people. I know. We are glad that you're here. Are you glad you're here? As is normally the case with this particular service, we'll have more filter in over the next uh, 15 minutes. But uh, glad that you are in here today. Uh, if you are a guest with us, as I look around the room, I don't see too many, but if you are a guest with us, uh, fill out the card that is in the pew right in front of you, the yellow card. You don't have to worry about filling all of that out. Uh, you can if you'd like, uh, but put, give us your name and your phone number, and we'd love to uh, reach out to you this week, let you know a little bit more about our, our church. Uh, we are just glad that you're here today, and we are working through, you're going to hear more and more about this as we go through this morning. We're working through Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Today, we're focused on peace. We all need God's peace from time to time, some, some days better, more so than, than others. Uh, but I'm glad that you're here today to hear about God's peace and what He wants for you. So let's begin our time of worship together in prayer. 
Father, I thank you for calling us here, for choosing us, for setting us apart to serve you. Lord, I pray that today that you would be glorified in all that happens here today. Every song that is sung, every note that's played, every word that is spoken. And Father, I pray right now for every person that is in this room and those that will filter in momentarily that we would be able, you would give us the strength and just the clarity to be able to focus our attention on you for the next hour. We often pray for you to come and be here, but God, your, your word says you're always with us. You never leave us, you never forsake us. The problem is we're usually looking elsewhere. So this morning, right now, Lord, help us to set aside the distractions and focus intently on you. Be glorified, as I said, in everything that is done as we lift our hearts to you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray it. Amen.
I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment. I don't know, I, I don't make it a big habit to watch the news, but if you watch the news, you know that uh, our world is struggling. We live in a fallen world and uh, deal with difficulties and conflicts all the time. And then personally, we each have struggles and things. Just today alone, uh, hearing from many of you in this room and those in the first service, there's, there's folks that have had not such a great week. And then those that have had good weeks, and we're going to have those. But today, what I want us to focus on is the fact that regardless of what kind of week we are having, what kind of struggles we are facing, Jesus offers us peace. And so I want to do something maybe a little uncomfortable for you, maybe different for you, but I'm going to ask you to stay awake, but close your eyes and focus your attention. What, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For some of you, it may be what's for lunch, uh, things that you've got to do this afternoon, maybe that person that cut you off in traffic on the way here. All these things compete for our attention. But right now, I want you to just let those things go. As I prayed, as we began, God is always here. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. His word says where two or three are gathered, I'm right there in the middle. The issue is never Jesus. The issue is always us. And are we paying attention? Are we focused? And so right now, I would just ask that, that you let those things go. And focus on the fact that the very Son of God, the one and only Son of God, left His place in glory to come to earth to show us how much God loves us. So much so that He died for you on a cross. And He rose again to give us salvation. And when he was here, he prayed for us, for his disciples and for us. And before he went to that cross, he said, my peace I give you. Today, right now in this moment, Jesus wants you to hear something. Jesus wants you to hear the words, I love you. And so no matter what is going on in your world today, know that Jesus loves you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done for us to make it possible to have a relationship with you, to have a relationship with the Father. And we thank you that when we submit to that, when we truly trust and know that you love us that much, that your peace is ours. All the other things that, that compete for our attention, they're just, they're just temporary. What lasts, what is eternal, is the fact that you love us. And you want a relationship with us. So help us today be able to set those things aside and truly focus on the fact that all will be well. No matter what. When we place our faith, our trust in you, all will be well. Let us breathe a little easier today, knowing that. Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray it. Amen.
darkest nights You were close like no Good morning, church. You may have a seat. This past weekend, the student ministry and I, we had our Disciple Now, and it was a wonderful time where we had teenagers 
uh, go to several different service projects throughout the city. We had them uh, come together for home group time for, in small groups with, led by college students and young adults. And then they met in people's homes, and then they came here uh, where they heard a guest preacher and a guest band. And all of this is only possible because of volunteers and through your donations. And so for that, we thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for helping us have a wonderful Disciple Now weekend. As we enter into a time of worship, as we, a time of worshiping through our giving, we remember that when we give, it's not just to keep the lights on, but it is to do ministry. Ministry like we saw this past weekend, ministry like we're seeing today, and ministry like all the many service projects we do throughout the week. If you look in your bulletin, you'll notice two things. The first is the QR code, which is the way we are um, taking donations right now. We are not passing the offering plate during this time. You can give through scanning that code. You can also give through the little boxes that you see outside the door. Or you can give through firstcorpus.org slash give. But also, if you look down in the bulletin below that QR code, there's a, little num or there's a box with several numbers in it. Even though we have changed up the way we've been given, even though we're still living in this time of uncertainty, we have been obedient in our giving. You have been obedient in your giving. And for that, on behalf of all the rest of the pastoral staff and all the other ministry leaders, thank you for your continued faithfulness. We are above budget in a way that we never thought we would be in a time when we're not passing the plate, so thank you for that. So for this next few moments, let's pray and let's prepare our hearts to worship God and to give back to him that which is already his. Heavenly Father, you are good. And you are so faithful. And when we worship you through our giving, we are reminded of how good you are. We are reminded of how much you have already given us. And we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to do so many different ministries this year. And we thank you as we look uh, into the spring and into the summer of all that you have already planned for us. God, I thank you so much for everyone in this room who's already been obedient. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Turn to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn me apart. You struck down to bind me up. You say you do it all in love, that I might know you in your suffering. Though you slay me. Yet I will praise you, though you take from me. I will bless your name, though you ruin me. Still I will worship, sing a song to the one who's all
Hi, I'm so glad that you're here today, and I'm glad I'm here today. I hope you're glad you're here today. We have been working through this passage, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, for several weeks now, and going just uh, taking it a little bit at a time. We spent a considerable amount of time in just in verse 12 alone because of all the virtues of compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience and those things. We've talked a lot about the reason that we're doing this, the reason we're going through and spending so much time just on these verses. And the reason is, and it's right there on the front of your bulletin, that we are to live the difference. When we let people know that we are believers, that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that we have given our lives to Him, then our lives should look differently. Our lives should, should point people to Him. And so the purpose of this series is really to help us understand the importance of, of our lives looking differently and the importance of pointing others to Him, but also how we do that and what that looks like. And, and so... We've been working through this and, again, talking about uh, how important it is to truly live lives that are worthy of the name of Jesus, to live lives that are worthy of, of being His child. And as I said, this passage really speaks to the fact that, that we are to exhibit these traits so that people see that difference in us. But today I want us to focus on, on peace. Because right in the middle of this passage, Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since you are members of one body, you are called to peace. We are to be people of peace. And the reason this is important, and I think the reason that Paul put it here, God inspired Paul to put it here. These are God's words through Paul. The reason that is here is we can't really live with consistency, with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness and love if we aren't secure in knowing whose we are. In knowing and having that peace, that, that part in with deep within us that knows that God is for us, that God is with us. And so I want us to really focus on this idea of peace and letting that peace rule in our lives. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. He goes on in verse 4, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. He is trustworthy. And so he says that when we keep our minds steadfastly on him, on this rock eternal, we have his peace. Let me read this text in full because most of you probably know this by now, but the challenge that I set before you at the beginning of the year, was to read Colossians 3, 12 through 17 every day between now and Easter, and then work on one of the virtues that you find here for a week. And so for those of you who have, who have not read the, the text today that are following along, and let me do that, and then you can check it off your list. Beginning in verse 12 of Colossians 3, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ Rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving 
Thanks to God the Father through Him. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. I want us to think about this idea of peace. We're going to spend quite a bit of time here this morning talking about what peace is, what it's not. When you think of peace, how would you define it? What comes to mind? Not rhetorical. Okay. Remember earlier when I said, close your eyes and don't fall asleep? Not having worries. That's peace. Yeah. What's that? Calmness. The the dictionary defines peace as a state of tranquility or quiet, such as in freedom from civil disturbance. It also offers freedom from, disqu- freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions or harmony. So if you look it up in the dictionary, that's what you'll find for the word peace. But from a biblical standpoint, I think it goes deeper than that. Peace, a lot of times when you think about peace, and in fact, the very first definition within the, the dictionary is this sense of tranquility uh, as freedom from civil disturbance. In fact, a lot of times you may think of there's war and then there's peace. But really what what I've heard is, is really more along the lines of what the Bible would suggest. We know it's established fact if you've been alive more than five minutes, and I'm looking around the room and I don't see any five minute year olds. If you've been alive, you know that the world is a broken place. And you're going to have good days, and you're going to have not so good days. And sometimes those days seem to stack together into not so good weeks. That's part of being human. That's part of the human condition. But as believers, we can have peace in the midst of that. So from a biblical standpoint, peace, irene is the Greek word, peace is not the absence of struggle or difficulty. That's not peace. Peace is freedom from fear and anxiety. That's peace. Those emotions like you talked about, not having those things. It is a blessing from God that overrules anxiety, that overrules worry. Why? Is that so important to understand? I believe it's important to understand because all of us are human and all of us have fear at times. Anytime that we are threatened, that the base of of fear is threat, Uh, our way of life, our very lives, uh, our values, there are lots of things in our world that will threaten us and that natural response to that is fear. But Jesus came to remove fear, to remove anxiety, to give us peace, not by taking the struggles away, but by reminding us that He is bigger. He has already conquered whatever we face. When we surrender to Him, when we do what Isaiah 26.3 says, to put our attention on Him, to focus on Him steadfast, then His peace is ours. It's when we let our distractions take over and we take our eyes off of Him that fear enters in and we don't experience His peace. But it's about surrender. It's about trust. I believe at the base of peace is trust. Why? Because we need to know that God is bigger than what we face. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus came as our high priest, and it says that he was tempted, he experienced life in every way that we do, except without without sin. So Jesus knows what you are facing. Regardless of the struggle that you face today, maybe you're having a good day, maybe you're not having a good day. Maybe you've had a really good week. I talked to two or three people uh, this morning already that said, this has been one of the hardest weeks in my life. And we're going to have those. 
So Jesus never said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will take all of your problems away. That's not what he said at all. He said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says. So my burden's easy and light. He never promised that things would be smooth. He just promised to never leave us or forsake us. And so our part in this is to truly trust that that is true. Trust that that is real. And when we place our trust in Him fully, then we receive His peace. When we know that God is bigger than anything we face, then we can face whatever it is with peace. Let me say that again. When we know, all capitals know, what is the definition of hope? My definition of hope, if I've shared with you before, it is a confident conviction. It's not wishful thinking. It's not saying, well, I hope God will take care of this. It is saying, I know God has my best interest at heart. It may not be what I want, but it's going to be for the best. And we have to trust that. So when we know, if we know that God is bigger than anything we face, than whatever we face, we can do so with peace. Because we know he's got this. He's bigger. This peace comes from Jesus. You may have heard me say this earlier already this morning, but Jesus prayed for us and Jesus offered. Before he went to the cross, he told, he was with his disciples and he says, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. I don't give to you As the world gives, don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus knew and knows that the reason we don't experience peace is because we're afraid, because of this fear, and that is a lack of trust. And so when we truly trust, and let me just stop right there for just a moment. I am not up here talking down to you. Well, Physically, I guess I am. I am not up here saying, I've got all this figured out. That I live this life perfectly and I never fear. That's not true. I am human. You are human. We're going to have those things that come into our lives that rock our world. Unless you've been living in a cave over the last two and a half years, we are living in a world that when COVID hit, it rocked our world. Everything we thought we could count on, we found out we couldn't. Our very health, we weren't sure anymore. And when our lives are threatened, it creates fear and anxiety. But Jesus says, I came to give you peace. He says, my peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. I don't give it the way the world gives it. And then he says, don't let your hearts be troubled or anxious. And don't be afraid. Jesus wants to give us his peace. And so this peace that Paul is talking about, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. That's the peace he's talking about. This understanding that all will be well because God is in control. It's a spiritual peace unlike anything else and only Jesus can give it. He reassures us in this passage in John 14 that that we aren't to be afraid. The word there is actually this idea of being uh, on death row. It carries the idea of not being condemned. Understand, he says, that you are not condemned. I am for you. My peace I give you. So don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. As I said, peace is not the absence of difficulty or struggle. It is freedom from fear and anxiety. Paul in Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He says, don't 
be afraid. Don't be anxious. But instead, take your concerns to God. Instead, turn your hearts to God and say, God, I'm struggling with this. I will just tell you, sometimes days aren't going to be good. Sometimes things are going to happen in our lives that we don't like. But we take those to God. and We say, God, I need your help. I need your strength. He says, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then he says, in the peace, the peace of God, and this is the BHT, the Brian Hill translation, the peace of God that doesn't make any sense at all to anybody else outside the faith. It doesn't make any sense at all. How can you possibly have peace in a time like this? The peace that doesn't make any sense at all, that transcends understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This inward serenity that Christ gives comes when we turn it over to Him, when we turn whatever is concerning us over to Him. The peace of Jesus leaves no room for fear. So Paul tells us in this passage, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule Rule your hearts. Your heart is that most inner part of you. That part that really only you know. And and trust me, God knows as well. In fact, he knows it better than you do. But the heart is that most inner part of you where everything comes out of. Jesus said, it's not what goes into a person that defiles them. It's what comes out. So he's talking about let the peace of Christ rule that part of you. And when that happens, I believe we can then live the difference. We can then show compassion and show kindness and be humble and be gentle and be patient and forgive and love. But it comes from that place within us that we trust that God has us, that no matter what happens to me, God is in control. That gives us the freedom to truly trust that God has me. No matter what happens, God has me. That frees us to live in accordance to what he has for us. Not so that people will think we're good people, but so that people will see him. To see that it really does make a difference when we proclaim and surrender our lives to Jesus. It makes a difference. We have to have that peace within us. Let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. This idea of rule is it's only this word is only used here in the New Testament, and it means to to be a guide, to be an umpire, uh, would be one translation of the word. But it's this standard, this guide by which all other things that we do are governed. This peace, let the peace of Christ guide you. Guide your actions, guide your thoughts, guide your attitudes. That's how we can live the difference. That's how we can be uh, compassionate and all these other things. But it's about surrender. When we want to rule our hearts, God can't rule our hearts. That's why Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule. Let that rule. Then you can do these other things. What directs your thoughts? What directs your attitudes? Your actions? The peace of Jesus frees us to focus on living the difference. There's one other thing that I want to point out before we close, and that is that we, he, he says, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. I believe that not only are we to be people who live with this peace, we are to share this peace. And that's part of what it means to be compassionate and kind and humble and gentle, and patient, forgiving. Colossians 1.20, if you go back two chapters, don't worry about turning there, but in that verse, it says that peace comes 
as Christ is reconciling the world to himself through his death on the cross. God's idea for peace is not just for me to have a better day, but is for the world to be reconciled to him, to see a bigger peace. And that's where the other ideas of peace come from, is this idea that we can all get along. But God intended creation to be his creation. But he gave us the choice to whether choose, to choose him or not to choose him. And what he created for good, we've demented through our sin. And it needs redeeming. It needs reconciling. So that's why Jesus came. And he came to bring this reconciliation, which will bring peace. And then he says, you are my instruments of peace. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, since you are to be people of peace. Members of one body called to peace. We are called to be his instruments of peace. But we can't do that if his peace doesn't rule our hearts. Think about the impact. Think about the difference that our community would see if our church, our family, were truly ruled by his peace. Think about the difference that people would see in our lives, if we were compassionate and all of these things, kind, humble, gentle, patient, forgiving, loving, more often than we weren't. That's a testimony. That's the difference that the world needs to see, that God created us to see. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he said, blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called the children of God. We are to be his instruments of peace. So it's not just that we have this peace within us, but we exude that peace. People see that peace. We offer that peace. People of peace share peace. So I want to challenge you today to remember who you are. To remember whose you are. That's more important. You are a child of God. Chosen, holy, set apart, loved. Because of that, we let his peace, we submit to him, we surrender to him and know that he has the best in mind for us and we rest in the fact that nothing can touch us. God is bigger. Because of that peace, we can be instruments of peace. So my challenge, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts today and remember that we are to be instruments of peace, to share his peace. God has a plan. God has a plan for this church, but more importantly, He has a plan for you. And that plan involves letting Him rule your life. Letting Him use you to make a difference. May He find us faithful in truly living the difference for Him this week. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank You for offering us Your peace. Your desire when you came to this earth was to bring us your peace so that others might see the difference it makes in our lives and be drawn to you, not drawn to us, not drawn to us being good people, but drawn to you. And so, Lord, today I pray that you would help us remember that we are your children and that you love us no matter what, and you are always with us. So no matter what we face, no matter what we are looking at today or this week, you're bigger. You are bigger. And there's nothing to fear. You are already victorious. So help us live in that understanding today and receive the peace that comes in knowing who you are. Thank you for that. In your name I pray it. Amen. Just a moment, I'll have you stand for a time of response. I don't know how God's working in your heart and in your life today. Some of you may be having a really good week or a really good month, and you think, man, God is good. And let me just say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. But it doesn't mean our life is good all the time. But we remember that God is good. So I don't know how God is working on your life today, where you are in this, but let me just tell you that God offers his peace when we surrender to him. 
So maybe during this time of response, it's just a time for you to open your heart to God and say, God, I need that peace. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus and experienced that peace, I'd love to talk to you about what that means and how you do that. If you'd like prayer, we'll be here. But in this time of response, truly focus on the fact that Jesus offers his peace. He wants you to have that peace. We just need to trust him. Focus on that as we stand and sing together. Aren't you glad that your forgiveness was bought and you didn't have to pay for it? What grace. When we trust in that fact, we have his peace. So my prayer for you 
as we close today, and as we go into the world for another week to be the church. You've heard me say this over and over again, I know. One of these days, y'all are going to throw hymnals at me or something, but just hear it. You're the church, but the church isn't in here. It's out there. It's you being the church every day, and sometimes that's hard. That's why we come back together to recharge, to go be the church again. So know that today. And as we're dismissed, may the God who chose you, who sets you apart, who cherishes you, created you to live for Him, give you the strength to truly trust Him with everything and experience a peace like you can find nowhere else. Amen. We're dismissed.